Eli, would you collect the Sunday school offering, please? Well, good morning, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Good morning. We've been looking at what does it mean to be a Pentecostal powerhouse, and we're looking at it from the aspect of comparing it to the person that we might consider to be a powerhouse. Somebody who goes to the gym all the time, lifts the weights, works out, does a, every day he's almost at the gym. And when we look at the guy that we look at as being rough, tough, and buff, all those muscles didn't develop overnight. He didn't get into that kind of shape overnight. But rather, it took consistent work, it can took consistent effort, the same thing is true with us as Christians. If we are going to become mighty in spiritual things, it's only first when we become consistent with our everyday walk with God. When we become consistent with reading the Bible, studying the Bible, when we become consistent in prayer. As we we don't become powerful in powerful in spiritual things overnight, but rather it's a progressive work. It takes time, it takes effort. It takes us constantly striving. We began studying this series by looking at faith. And do you remember what the enemy of faith is? Doubt. We go off and go to that famous passage of Jesus coming out of the wilderness and how he said that this kind comes not out but by prayer and fasting. But before, but when the disciples asked him why this kind come not out, before he struck them and said that this kind come not out by prayer and fasting, he told them one other tidbit. He said, it's because you doubt it. So doubt is the enemy of faith. And we've talked about prayer. We've talked about coupling it with fasting. And we moved on to talking about the gifts of the armor of God. And when we look at the armor, how much of the armor are we instructed to put on? All of it. We're instructed to put all of it on. Because we are in a warfare, and we did an illustration at the very beginning of it, looking at how many demons possibly there are out there. And while we might be attacked by one demon at a time, there might, be come, there might come a time when we're surrounded from all sides. And just having the shield is not going to protect us on all fronts. Just having the breastplate is not going to protect us on all fronts. But rather, we are to put on the whole armor of God that we may be completely protected. And what keeps our entire armor together is that belt. And that belt is made up of it's composed of truth. And when we look at truth, we live in a world where truth is quote unquote relative. But when we get down to the bare bones, truth is not relative. It's not whatever we want it to be. Truth is whatever God says that it is. And we base our entire spiritual armor is held together by the truth of God's word. I'm just trying to get my notes here real quick. And we talked about how the armor is not like any other armor that we've seen before. We compared it to the, the armor that Saul gave David. The armor that Saul gave David was one size doesn't fit all. It was made specifically for us all. But when we look at the armor of God, it is designed for each one of us, and it is alive. It grows and shrinks with us and our relationship with God. I'm just trying to get where I'm at in my notes, that's all. So last week we began studying the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God. We talked about how in Hebrews 4 and verse 12, where the Bible states that the sword, the Word of God is quick, it is powerful. The Greek word there actually means that it is alive. It is alive and powerful for us to use in our everyday life. We talked about that there are two forms of the Word. There is the Logos and the Rhema. The Logos is the written word of God. God gave us the scriptures to defend ourselves against the wiles of the enemy. Because there are some things that if we can have a relationship with God, 
But there are just some things we may not know unless we really sit down and study the Word of God. Things like when we're struggling and we've done everything we can do to stand, we can stand therefore knowing that we are uh, planted in God and that when things are tough, the Spirit of the Lord's going to come in and He's going to fight our battle for us. There are things that we can find out that through studying the Word of God, that whatsoever we ask in His name, we'll have it because we don't pray in it. Now, those are things that we acquire from reading the Logos Word of God and studying. But then there's things that are powerful because of the Rhema, the living Word of God. <laughs> what or who is the living Word of God? The Rhema? We find that in John chapter 1 and verse 1. What does John 1 1 state? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. I think it's verse 13 of John, chapter 1 here. Hey, we get a better understanding of who exactly John's talking about the Word was. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word of God is quick, it is powerful, and it is alive. And it is there for us to use. Um, every commentary I've read will state that it is an offensive weapon. I disagree. I think it's a defensive weapon. Because there are times the enemy is going to come against you and you're not going just going against the kingdom of hell, but there are times you have to defend yourself. When we look at Jesus in the wilderness, the devil came in to bother him and tempt him. And what did Jesus use against him? The written word of God. It was a defensive weapon. The enemy was coming in, and, the, and Christ defended himself with the word of God. So today we're going to move on, and we're going to get out of the armor. And we're going to move on to the next step of what does it mean to become a Pentecostal powerhouse. We've talked about the basics. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about fasting. And just a little bit of side note, when you're reading Ephesians chapter 6 there with the armor, Guess what it talks about right after it talks about the sword of the spirit? Prayer. Prayer is one of the most unutilized weapons in the church's arsenal today. And with that being said, we're going to move on. If someone would please read John chapter 14, verse 26. John 14, 26. And someone else find Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. Acts 2, 4. If someone has John chapter 14, 26. Go ahead and read it there, Jeff. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. But the Comforter, who's the Comforter? Scripture, interpret Scripture. Which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. What about Acts chapter 2 and verse 4? And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as they, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What are we getting ready to talk about? We're getting ready to talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. At this point, being a Pentecostal powerhouse, this person should have already received salvation. They should have already, we've already studied faith, we've talked about studying prayer, we've studied fasting. As soon as, and I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me back up. So let's get down into the bare bones. Who is the Holy Ghost? Well, He's what well, we consider the third person of the Trinity. The first person being the Father, the second person being Jesus Christ, the third person being the Holy Ghost. We get that from 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7, if someone would please read that. So there are, or there are three that bear record of that. 
Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, the deep three or one. There's how many that bear record in heaven? So there are three that bear record in Father and heaven. Can you read them again, brother? Because I'm not remembering my note. Yes. Uh, the Father. The Father. Father. The Word. And the the Word and the Holy Ghost. Who did we say the Word was? Jesus. Jesus Christ. If we want to go back to where Scripture interprets Scripture, just rocking our brain, where can we go in the Word of God to prove that the Word is speaking of Jesus Christ? We just talked about it literally this morning. It's not in your notes. What book would we go back to?
where the Bible states, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He then goes on to conclude, This is the standard Jesus gave, back, gave to the church. According to William Seymour, the baptism of the Holy Ghost was a second gift of grace from God. The first gift of grace was that of <coughs> salvation. When we look at the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it must be evidenced by the speaking in other tongues. Speaking in other tongues is the evidence that someone has been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is not stammering lips where they're just mumbling stuff. It is um, words in a different language that that person does not know. It is evidenced by the outward showing of speaking in other tongues. We, get, we take that from Acts chapter 2 and verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This here, Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, is what we call the Pentecostal passage. This is where the disciples were waiting for the pouring out of the Holy Ghost, the sending of the Comforter, and they were praying in the upper room. And this is where the Holy Ghost came through like a mighty rushing wind. It is, and I cannot stress enough, it is a gift from God. It cannot be manufactured by man. It is directly from heaven. And when we look at the speaking of other tongues aspect of it, it is a language that is not known to that individual. Could it be an earthly language? It absolutely could be. When we read Acts chapter 2 in its entirety, we find that the men there were confounded because they heard each one speaking in another's dialect. Something that they did not know, a language that they did not know, but yet someone else in the room recognized it. Or it could all together be entirely a heavenly language. However, the basis still comes back that it is a language that is not previously known to that individual. If you're praising God and you know Spanish and all of a sudden you start speaking Spanish, that is not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You're just praising God in another language that you already know. The language that God gives us is one that is entirely unknown to that individual. Once so the, you say it there with the Holy Spirit, you could have interpreters down here when you speak in tongues. Uh, they wouldn't recognize any language that comes out of your mouth. Yes. Because I'm, I'm probably getting ahead of myself. But what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 13? <coughs> It could be. Do you have the passage there, brother? Though I speak not. I know you. It's in, uh, I think, the fifth verse. <coughs> he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, that speaketh out. For he that prophesied, that by the church. I would that be all faith with tongues. But rather, that be prophesied. For for if he who is he that prophesied and he that speaketh the tongue, that says he that interprets that the church may receive that advice. I'll be honest, brother, you're a little off from what I was looking for, and the only reason I say that is because when we're looking at the passage you read, it's referring to the gift of tongues interpretation, not the actual uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost or the pray or even the fire of tongues. <laughs> Because that's different than when you and I take off and we're just praying in tongues. Because that's referring to um, use for the church body. Paul said in it, uh, in one of his epistles, I think it was 1 Corinthians 12, 13. I could be wrong. It might be 12 or 11 after all. Though I speak not with uh, tongues of men and of angels. What... Uh... What 
chapter, what verse is this? Is that 13 1? 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 13 1. Do you have it there? You want to just read it so we're clear? So when we're looking, looking at the tongues, it could be a known language, or it could be something heavenly, something that is completely unknown in this world, that no interpreter could ever interpret. So then actually it's coming from heaven. Then it's coming from heaven, I mean, yes. And that's the only thing it could be, that I get come right from heaven. <laughs> Though I speak with the tongues of angels, and have not charity, I am nothing. So it could come directly from heaven. And it is followed, following the baptism of the Holy Ghost with evidence, when I say with evidence, I mean with the speaking of an unknown tongue to the individual, that God bestows upon the individual at least one gift. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11 state? 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Dividing to every man severally as he will. We just got done in that passage that Brother Dennis read. If you read prior to it, you will find that he's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And then he gets to the end and he said that the Spirit gives to every man severally as he and God, the Holy Ghost, will. So once we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is then followed by us receiving gifts. And those gifts are to be used through the Holy Ghost. It, once again, those gifts cannot be manufactured by men. But we are looking at spiritual things. They come from God. We cannot manufacture these things. Every time I, I was preparing and studying for this, I kept going back to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. What does it talk about uh, good works? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So it's not of ourselves. And what's the reason for it? Lest any man should boast. When we're talking about spiritual things, they come directly from God. They are not manufactured by us. We don't get up one day and Brother Eli decides to go to church and say, well, today I'm going to give a message in tongues. And today Brother Dennis doesn't come into church and say, well, you know what? Today I'm going to interpret tongues. Or um, Mom and myself don't get together and say, well, I'm going to give a message in tongues and you interpret today. That is not the gift. Those are not the gifts of the Spirit. That's how the devil creeps into the church. The gifts of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, our faith, our righteousness, they all come from one source and one source alone. God. And why is that? For me, my mind keeps going back to Ephesians 8 and 9. 2, 8 and 9. Lest any man should boast. They're not of us. They're not manufactured by us. They come from one source and one source alone. And that is God. Why do I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost? First of all, I forgot my illustration. It gives you power over the devil. My first point, brother, was it's a free gift. How many people do you hear say, if it's free, it's for me? But sadly, we don't hear that a lot of times in the church world. Or we might hear it, but we don't see it. Uh, uh, what are you saying, baptism gives you the power over the devil? I thought uh, Jesus Christ is the power over the devil. He does. But there is an entirely different situation. When we go back to where Jesus said that he is with you and shall be with, shall be in you, those are two entirely different situations. 
in themselves. Speaking from somebody with the baptism, I can tell you there was a whole different situation when I was in Sunday school as a teenager and felt the Holy Ghost goosebumps on my back versus when I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost and feeling the Holy Ghost, whether he stirred up in my belly, moving around, moving throughout my extremity. There is something entirely different versus not having the baptism versus having the baptism of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> there is a greater power that comes with it, not because of who you are or because of who I am, but because of who God is. And the more that we develop our relationship with God, for the individual that has the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the more, not that the person who does not have the baptism, don't get me wrong, not that they cannot become more powerful through the Holy Ghost, but there is an entirely different situation. Once you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, it is entirely different. It, so, Brother Eli, am I, am I wrong with that? You, it is entirely different. You got me confused here. You receive and you're filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. How can you be filled again with the Holy Spirit through baptism? Once you're filled, you're filled. You get, and we'll talk about that here. Well, it's not going to be today, but we'll you know, talk about Do you understand where I'm at? I do. You know, when you, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, why? How can you be filled again with the Holy Spirit being baptized? Because when you get receive salvation, you are not filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You get a portion of the Holy Ghost. Ah. You are not completely filled. So you're not filled one hundred percent. No. You might be filled fifty percent when you first receive. I never heard that before. You get a small taste of the Holy Ghost, and we'll, we we. I don't make sense. The more you seek after that's, that's like God, God cheating you. The more you no, seek, no. The more you God didn't even, it. God didn't even have to give you the back, the Holy Ghost in any form. Correct. He saved you. That should be enough. But He went farther than that. The more you seek oh, after, you. the more you will I agree with you, brother. And let me just see. If you give me a moment, let me browse over my notes real quick. <coughs> I never heard that. I've been to. Right, ten churches, I know. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1:13 and 18. Ephesians 1:13 and 18. That is where we're getting it. When we look at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 18, the Bible states this. And whom he also trusted after that he heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after that he believed that ye were sealed with the Holy Ghost of promise. You were sealed. You were not filled completely. You were sealed. And when we go down to verse 4, 14 and 6, which is the <laughs> earnest of your inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. If we look and find out what an earnest is, it's no different than, Brother Eli, if I were to pass away, I'm going to leave everything I own into your possession. And to make sure that you know that I'm good in my word, here's ten bucks. I'm going to give you. You laugh, but it's a little bit of your inheritance now. That is exactly what is going on in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4, 13, is it 13, 14? <laughs> That is exactly what's going on in this passage. God has laid up for us an inheritance. And all the Holy Ghost is saying is, here's a little bit of your inheritance now. You are not filled with the Holy Ghost upon salvation. You have the Holy Ghost with you to guide you and direct you. But you are not filled with it. Because when you receive salvation, you are in the exact same boat the disciples were at the same time when Jesus told him that the Holy Ghost is with you that's the position you are with salvation. The Holy Ghost is not in you. You have a small portion with you as an earnest, as a portion of your inheritance, but you are not filled with the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? Say that again. When you receive salvation, the Holy Ghost, He is with you. You mean salvation? You believe in God. You believe in Jesus Christ. Not believe in God. I'm going, I'm going farther. Die for your sins and exactly. 